So welcome everyone. My name is Hannah Doss. I'm the program coordinator at UNLV, um, at their outdoor adventure department. And I've been working with Nate to um, put on these sessions. This is our second one. Um, so we were just running the same session twice to try to accommodate all the different schedules. We've got um, uh, over 19 other universities that we were working with to put this on. They're all from across America. Um, so our hope is that to, um, by today you've already watched the documentary that's on, um, that's Nate's documentary about going up to Everest. Um, and then today we will have a discussion about the film, his experiences on Everest and what he hopes to pass on to others. Yeah, so here's Nate Menninger. He is one of the first ever foreign born porters to aid a Mount Everest expedition. And I'll pass it over to Nate now and let him introduce himself and tell his story. Yeah, I, I, yeah I, thank you. I'm just kind of a regular guy, so I don't know about all that. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming on. I figure if you're here, you're probably either here because you have to be or you're interested in, you're actually interested in Everest. So Hopefully I'll give you guys something that you can take on and take with you and run with and do more than I did. Um, I don't know. I wish I had all cameras. If you want to turn your camera on, Josh or anyone, you can, as I said before, if not, that's fine. Um, did everyone, did everyone have a chance to watch the film? I don't mind if you didn't, I wouldn't be offended at all. If you have seen the film, I didn't put anything of myself in it. So I cut out this video of myself and there's a reason for that, that I can explain at the end, but this will just gonna give you a summation of like who I am and what brought me to this event. So uh, it's a little cheesy. It's very cheesy, I warn you, but so it is. And right now we're looking at a news report of Nate Manning. We're in Oakland on this little picture. Nate Manning was born in no, you gotta do better than that. You gotta get some air and talk. Oh. Oh, no, but I didn't think he'd be so stupid. He's look at you. He's got no, he's got no hurt himself. He's got no idea of his body. He's got no desire to protect himself. Yes. All right, so like I said, pretty cheesy, let's be honest. But um, that's pretty much it. If I'm only going to tell my story so that maybe you guys pull something out of it. That's the only reason I'm doing this. But for me, I went to college for sports. That was it. I left a better academic school for a lesser academic school because I just wanted to play sports, professional sports, and that was it. Like that was everything that mattered to me. And so I majored in Spanish because – I was already fluent in Spanish when I got to school and it was easy. And I studied philosophy because I could read one paragraph from the reading and write the eight page paper. It was, uh, it was just trying to do what was easy because I just wanted to do sports, but I got injured. And so uh, I had a little more time to think and, and get away. I wanted to get away. So that sophomore year I went to Spain and I ran with the bulls and that was like, I don't know if you guys know of this whole red, when Red Bull first took off, it was like, how crazy can you go? How close to the edge of a building or how, you know, the whole parkour trend and everything was like, how nuts can you go and get noticed? And for me, I was like, okay, let's, let's do this event running on the bulls, let's call it in the most extreme way possible, which to me is like, okay, as a local, as a professional, and then 
to the most extreme extent possible. So can I do it just like they would? And then can I do what the best of them would? And uh, I fell in love with that concept. And as I continue to get really, really injured, which might be something that happens to you, whether it's, you know, whatever, physically or mentally, sports were becoming unable to play. And I couldn't handle the thought of looking at, you know, athletes on TV and realizing like that would, that is not me. Like that's not my name on the back of the Jersey. I failed. I just need to get away. And at the same time, I'd been sneaking away to do these projects. And so when, uh, when graduation came around, you know, if you've ever met a lacrosse player, I don't suggest it, but if you have, um, I can, I went to UVA, so it's, it's considered the highest, which also means it's very pretentious and very, wealthy and very elite you know it's like everything you think of is very accurate to what it is and uh you know i didn't want to go into the finance world everyone goes to finance i didn't know what i want i just wanted to get away so i just left i just packed a bag with a snowboard and saxophone and just took off and uh this was this was the picture my first picture on instagram with my family um i like to show this because it's like pretty obvious where we came from you know it's like a nice house like you can tell it's pretty nice my family looks pretty cookie cutter i have this virginia lacrosse tatter across my front shirt like okay we see where you're coming from and i went straight from there to south america where if you guys have read it all about these artists and, and whatnot i pretty much just lived like that like a just out of complete poverty for like six months you know, like living under the stairs in a Harry Potter sized room on a bed that was on the floor with one wall, it's glass eating, you know, white rice and salt and, and like starving myself and deciding between, you know, do I save a couple of dollars for a beer so I can meet more people or, you know, for food, it was, that was the decision. And uh, I did manage to do a couple of things of projects. The first was this backcountry scheme in Patagonia. So if you guys, you guys are obviously in the outdoor world, you're probably like skiing and snowboarding. There's this place called the Super Sea Coular. Um, it's very famous at Portillo. And I had heard caught wind of it. And this guy had invited me to live in his van and, and uh, he was going to pay for the van. And since I could drive stick, I could go for free. So uh, I went and uh, if you know anything about skiing, you're supposed to have all this avalanche gear. I did not very stupid. I bought crampons and an ice axe the night before. I never known how to use them and went and did this. And, uh, the guy who took this photo turned around. It's not as it's to say that I'm probably pretty dumb for going on, um, and not being as prepared as I should. And I realized then like, okay, I, I'm probably going to die if I get too extreme here. Uh, so I kept going throughout South America and then things had transitioned to more cultural extremities, I guess. And so I ended up at a favela in Brazil at the edge of a favela, and right behind this, this is a barred window. And behind it is just a tile floor. And I just slept on this floor for almost two weeks without a shirt, wearing these pants I'm wearing now. It's, um, and we were very, very, very poor. It was like, anyways, you guys will probably have experiences similar to that if you go out on your way. Uh, but I just was finding I'm in love with these. I'm in love with these extreme adventures. Like this is what this is what I must do. Like I have to do something. My friends have a hundred thousand dollar jobs. You know, that's probably exaggerating, but my friends have jobs and uh, I, I can't just be traveling, you know, to everyone. I just look like this nomad hippie uploading occasional picture, looking into the distance, something like that. And uh, it was just wearing on me. So I would write and write and write and write and write. Cause that was the only way I figured I could ever make an income was writing. And uh then I started, when I came back, I aligned my life more around this and did a couple more projects and had a couple more really bad failures and some stupid things and some not stupid things. And uh, the reason I learned Nepali was to swear to, to go knock on the door of a monastery in Nepal so that I could swear to science for like three months or something. Cause I figured that would be an insane thing to write about. So that's why I learned Nepali. And uh, that's why I first went to Nepal. It didn't quite happen like that, but, uh, it was the idea of these projects and months later after I tried to become a stripper, after I tried to join Nat Geo just to pitch my own thing, after I tried to write for the director of black mirror and did just because I thought he would give me my own show 
just so I could do these projects and have a, like not be poor forever. After all that fell through, you know, I was just like, I posted a resume on LinkedIn of like, what am I going to do? This is what I want to do. And this clearly why I'm not doing anything is this doesn't exist. And then the thing went viral and uh, I was like, maybe I should, maybe I should do something with this in my life. So I launched this film and this is pretty embarrassing, but I made a couple of videos, you know, to promote it. And at the end of one, I wrote, <coughs> you guys are going to hate it, but at the end of one, I wrote, if a no name amateur like me can do it. And so can you share this so we can inspire others to pursue their own dreams. It's like, dude, as I say, if you don't want to punch me in the face from that, I don't know what's going to get you, get you up. Uh, that was true. I was like full on Instagram. I thought that was the move. I thought this was how people were going to pay me to do this project. And yeah, I wanted to show the lives of porters and I wanted to bridge this gap, but more than anything, I wanted proof of what I do. Cause who would buy as a millennial? Why would you buy a book nowadays? Like no one reads. I don't read. So even though I write, why would you buy a book? And then why would you believe what's ever in the book? Cause nowadays you can't believe anything. So if I share these stories, who's going to believe it? I needed proof, right? I needed a reason for people to buy my books and I needed, I needed a reason for them to believe. And so I was like, I'll just get a camera and go this and this is for me and boom. And so I went to Nepal and, and landed. I somehow raised a bit of money and I landed on this hostel bed. So I don't know if you guys have traveled at all and stayed in hostels. This is one bed in a room of 12 or 10 beds and I have a, a little, this bag on the left with the 47 mark that is bag that I've been living out of for years. And on the bed is a, a film gear, a camera that I don't really know how to use much more than you know how to use a camera. You know, my dad did a little education, but I don't really know any of that. And I didn't want to. Um, and I'm sleeping on this bed. And about two weeks in, you know, I had planned this whole elaborate, I'm climbing Everest. I'm going to raise $65,000. My filmmaker is going to, is going to film me and that money will go for her and, and uh, perfect. Like that's just how it's going to work. $65,000 is going to come to me. <laughs> and that's obviously delusional and everything I'm in Nepal. This is why I don't suggest, but I was in Nepal two weeks in and everything fell through the videographer who is a critically acclaimed person dropped out and the company I was supposed to work with that did not materialize. So I, was now in Nepal having spent other people's money who were just like friends and a loan from a friend and a doctor's assistant, you know, like people, you know, their money, I'd spent it, spent some of it. And I had never made a film. I never researched it. I'd never known about it. Very unprepared. I'm like, what do I do? And so I figured if I kept going through the motions, somehow the money would come and I started training for climbing. I don't know if you have ever climbed guys, but and all these knots and stuff and double fishermen and whatnot. And I figured if I learned all of these for Everest, the money will come. So I got an Everest summoner to teach me and a, uh, an assistant cameraman showed up who I asked not to. And his name was Babin Dulal. And Babin had time. He accepted no money. He was like, I'll do it. I'll do it. I was like, Whoa. literally met him a few days before we left. And I don't even think I had a company at the time. And so I got up out of bed when I realized I had no company and went downtown. And if you've ever been, I took this from online from Wikipedia, but if you've ever been to Nepal or to Asia, it's very crowded. And in downtown Kathmandu, if you look closely, you can see on the walls, advanced adventures at the top and Himalayan glacier trekking. And behind that, there's Porn de la Adventure. And on the left, Himal treks. And behind that, probably another. In this little vicinity, there's like four or five companies all dedicated to trekking so it's it's hard to really understand but it's pretty clear like this is a very important industry this is like the tech industry to america right it's like a gold rush you go there there's so many companies to choose from everyone wants a piece of the pie because you have this foreign money coming in so that factors in later but i was like i'll just ask one and maybe they'll take me and one out of 20 it was the first one i asked agreed to let me join them I didn't have a work visa, so I was kind of illegal. Um, and it was very like, okay, well, how much money am I going to get? Okay, that's not a lot. Okay, I'll, I'll probably be screwed. 
but okay, let's just do the project. It was very like just cerebral. Like, I'm not gonna, I can't tell you what no having no money feels like, right? You have to have no money. And so then we left. And so with a camera there, with my only chance to like prove what I do, I went very, very, very deep into this because I had literally no other option in my life. I'd put myself in a corner, like I had no jobs. I didn't do internships, not very smart on that front either. I had railroaded myself. So I had to go balls to the wall. And I was like, I'm just going to do every single thing that a porter does. I'm going to do. I'm going to use the same toilets. I'm going to buy the same shirts. I'm not going to have new shoes. I'm not going to have new shoes. How many pairs of underwear? What kind of shirt? Cotton shirt, probably, because they wouldn't have dry fit. Just everything you can imagine. And uh, for the first eight days, we walked along this path. And if you ever go to Everest, this is kind of like an introduction to what it looks like when you go. Um, you can either fly to Lukla, which if you read about it, is the last air base before Everest, or you can walk on the original path that Edmund Hillary, who, did, who first summited Everest, found. And you walk through the valleys, and these are the little roads. They're not roads. They're little paths you walk on. And in front is a porter, and he's carrying, you know, 100 kilos. And porters don't just work at Everest. They work everywhere throughout the Himalaya. They transport, because there are not as many roads, so they transport goods everywhere and when you don't have an animal you have to carry it by foot to restaurants hotels everything you know and uh porters are what do that they're the ones who get paid to do this and people will still do it for their families but those who get paid are called porters and so eventually you know the whole time walking the diet is screwing me up because it's a very salt-based diet so if you want to go and just for fun try putting salt in your tea and putting salt in your rice and not eating any Snickers or any fruit juice or any sugar, just switch your diet completely. It will screw you up a bit. In those first eight days, I was like having like convulsions and I had no energy. I was very lethargic and I didn't, I, I thought I had diabetes. I remember writing in a journal, I was like, maybe I have diabetes. I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, but I eventually I adjusted in the same time. I didn't even know if I'd have a job there. Like, would I, would the guy text actually come through and like, would there actually be work for me? I don't know. I just talked to some guy down in town. That's a long way from here. And uh, fortunately we get there, it happens and we meet the porters and I have a job. And so we meet Jibon and Sukra Tamal. And these are the two guys I'm going to be working with. Um, and they've been portering for a while. And the next day we meet the clients and the clients are sitting there and they're all staring at me. I took a snapshot when they're not staring at me because it felt weird, but uh, they are all staring at me. The guide's staring at me. The porters are staring at me. I'm like, I have a camera, but all I want is the same experience. That's my only goal. Because in my mind, I want to see if I can handle what a porter can handle. Can I handle what the strongest job on the earth has to handle? Am I strong enough? It was very self-centered. And uh, so the name like shake me. Hey, here's Nate, the porter. I'm like, I'm like, no, this is like, these are, these are the porter. Like what's their name? What's their name? Don't look at me because look at them. And if you look at me, look at them. I just wanted the same exact thing. So from then on, every single second, I don't like, if we walked into a house and they turned and were like, do you want tea? I'd be like, do you want tea? Do you want to sit down? Like, do you want to sit down? I was always asking for the worst. And uh, if there's ever a porter on the ground, I'd be like, I want to sleep on the ground. I just wanted to experience what the absolute worst conditions were that I could and then see if I could do it. That was it. You know, it wasn't so much to what it's become now. It was more just that. And uh, it was so, it was like comical to a point. It was like, it wasn't the season. So there's two blankets for everyone. But uh, they said in season, it's so crowded, you only get one blanket. So I would throw off the other blanket. I'd be like, no, I only want one blanket, you know? And they'd, they'd laugh. And it was just comical ignorance. Like, you're being ridiculous. And I think it helped me get in. There's a few things that kind of set me off. Like, like this is strange. I mean, because going so deep, it sounds okay, but you're, you're going to put your mind in a place that you didn't expect over time. And the first thing that kind of set it off is it sets off these red flags in your mind that you just kind of store away for later. But the first was this woman 
it's like 11 a.m. or 10 a.m. And this woman is cooking Chang, which is a local rice wine, a local alcohol. And two of the porters who are carrying massive loads are about to drink this in the morning. And I'm like, what the hell? And so you can see it's that white stuff coming out. It's called Chang, if you want to Google it. It's very sweet. It's not that strong, but it's alcohol. And I've played very high level athletics. And I'm like, this is, insane. never ever have I seen an athlete during competition drink. I've seen in summer, sometimes people drink in the summer, but this is not, this is your livelihood. Like, this is the morning. This is, it's not like a summer one off event. This is like your life and you're doing this. I don't know why. And some said because it's warm. In my mind, I'm like, is it because it's warm or is there something else going on here? I don't know. I'm not going to question. I'm just going to keep going. And uh, then you walk in deeper and you're going deeper the whole time. And then there's the, the issue of food. And at the high camp in Dingboche, which is quite high, they're digging potatoes out of the ground in the back. And these potatoes, they then bring inside just like that. And, <clears throat> and we eat them. They're right beside here. You can't see them. We eat them just like that. You peel off the top and you take a bite and it's just like a potato with salt, just a plate of potato. It's not like cooked like you do at home. It's just, it's just sustenance. Like this is just to survive. And this is for carbs and fuel. And as we're at that table shortly after, they're showing me a picture right here on their phone of a guy who's fallen down um, in a nearby pass and has frostbite and he's getting hella backed out. So if you know about Everest and you've read about it at all, which I assume you guys probably know something because you're in this meeting, then you, you've probably heard that the Porter and Sherpas are like lauded as gods and never experiencing anything bad at all. But here I am and one's falling victim to frostbite and can't get up and has to be hella backed out. And as we're growing higher, they start to get sick and more sick. And then they're coughing and you're realizing that like no one's immune to this, you know, this is, this is hard. It's cold. The altitude is starting to get at you. Um, and I'm just kind of, I'm always last. I'm always last behind everyone. I'm always trudging along. And when we get to the high camp, you know, we're at, at uh, this place called Kalapatar and the cities get much smaller as you get up until the last place porters, always sleep in a segregated home. And at the last place, there's only one home for all porters. Whereas before there could be multiple and they're all for families and stuff. At the last place, it's all one. So there's 40 of us packed into this room eating dinner in a segregated hotel, no showers. Clients don't know where we are. We're off in the corner somewhere and we're eating dinner. And by this point, dinner is pretty much just rice. There's a little vegetables in like a broth with the little lentils in it. And, uh, pretty skimpy and on one side of the room on the left uh are the people who are going to work on everest like there will summit everest as porters i don't know if they'll summit but they'll work on it on the right is all the local like all the porters like us who are just supplying the region with everything it needs and working for all these people who come to the himalaya to trek it you know while a thousand go for everest 70 plus thousand just go to nepal and the himalaya to just trek elsewhere to these other places and uh you know we obviously want to become Everest porters that's the, that's the goal that's the hierarchy but uh we're making 15 dollars a day <laughs> like at the high camp costs are so high because they rise they're 20 dollars. so we're literally losing money as we're working and to become a porter on everest you know a sherpa as people call him which is the wrong name that's just an ethnic group you need like three thousand dollars to buy equipment six hundred dollars for boots alone how the, hell, how the hell would you raise that money and get saved that money as a porter when you're losing money as you're working? And there's literally, you'd have to starve yourself or eat half meals or get a massive tip. So we obviously all want a big tip. And uh, you know, you add insults to injury in the back or this is where we go to sleep. But the power is cut because the government just cuts power to save money. There's 20 of us packed into these bunk beds Three of us on each minimum, and he's saying it's hard today. It's hard. I'm like, it's hard. Why? It's really hard today. He said, we're not going to fit three people. And it, it was like, 
you know, at 2 a.m., at 2 a.m., I wake up and I don't have a blanket. <laughs> and we're sleeping with all, everything we own. Like, everything you own in the coldest of weather, when you're going out to play sports with your friends, put it on and then sleep with that. And you even have a face mask. That's when you know it's cold. And then my, my blanket's gone. And I look to my left and I'm like, they, they've raveled it up. I'm with two other porters that I, I don't even think I've met. And I'm sleeping with them. And I'm like, first, I'm like, I'm going to kick these porters and take my bet, my blanket back because I want my blanket. <laughs> and I move and I'm like, that's probably not the move. You know, I get to leave in like however many days I'm done. So nothing, if, if no, no epiphany hit me yet, but it was just like, all right, let's be, let's not kick them. And uh, sure enough, two weeks later, I left Nepal after eating gluttonous amounts of food and recovering. I'd lost 20 pounds. My body was a fraction of itself. Like all my muscle had gone, but I was somehow stronger. My bones were like, it was pretty cool. And my, I hadn't showered for three weeks. And somehow my skin was soft and smooth below this like layer of grime. When I showered, it was no pimples, no acne. It was quite amazing. And I left two weeks later and went, went straight to Hollywood. And I published this on my Instagram. <laughs> I never thought that Hollywood would seem like a bigger challenge at Everest. But tomorrow, after six years of preparation, I finally take the leap. Yet another moment Well, you probably want to punch me in the face. This one was like, you know, I, that experience that I just walked you through, that I walked through, like that's not gonna, that's not gonna hit you in two weeks. No way. I was making a movie at the time, so my mind is already taken. And I went to Hollywood and tried to sell the series concept of me doing around the world and and uh, just biking to these meetings and going to all these events and I was on a bike with no brakes, eating 7-Eleven hot dogs to survive, you know, sleeping on a friend's couch. Like this is not stuff you write home about. And me, I thought I was glorifying it to be this, you know, artist, but no, I was like not in a good place. My mind was going very down. It was devolving and I didn't know why. And I had to come home and uh, I started editing the film because I wanted Hollywood to come in and make it for me. So I'll make them a trailer and they didn't. And so I kept making more and more and more. And it took months until I realized like what it was I had until I stopped making the movie with just, you know, the cutaways of me saying like, welcome to freaking Nepal. And let me tell you about this and that. It took months until, you know, you realize you're a foreigner. You're a foreigner with proof of another person's career, with proof of another person's career that's in a problematic state. And you're a foreigner who has all this. Like you don't, you're not from there. And you have this footage and no one else does really. So it was like a crash course personally and a ton of emotions, a lot of emotions. But uh, I think coming out of it, one is like, okay, people started different. You know, I didn't believe in privilege at all. I didn't think it was a real thing. I didn't think people were different. I just thought like you work as hard as you are and that's what you are. And there's no different starting points, but I'm clearly wrong. And I know that now 